Elder, who is, uh, I would say, Mr. Uh, I. He's written a multi-volume set of books that you can find in most uh, uh, medical school libraries. And Sir Stuart Duke Elder, an Englishman, uh, wrote a book in this series called The Eye on Evolution. And in the book, he says that uh, unless you're willing to get, engage in a lot of speculation and what have you, he says there have been a lot of thought that have been put on the subject of the origin of the eye, the vertebrate eye, with its inverted retina and everything. And he says that up to now, it's a problem that is as yet unsolved. This is in a book called The Eye and Evolution. I wouldn't have even brought this up, except he goes further than that. He says, not only is it unsolved, but assuming you don't want to get involved with a lot of useless speculation, he says it seems little likelihood of, that we'll ever find a solution. So you got the picture? He says, we don't know anything about the origin of the eye, point one. Point two, he doesn't think we're ever going to know anything about the evolution of the eye. This is amazing. Did I forget to tell you that this book is 843 pages long? 843 pages to say we know nothing, we never will know nothing about the eye. Now, I'm pretty long-winded. I'd have gotten this across six, 700 pages easy. <laughs> But evolutionists are convinced that the, uh, not only was the eye not created, it occurred by chance, and so having occurred by chance, it's not the least bit surprising. It's a piece of junk, poorly made. Frank Zendler, who has a website, you can look this up for yourself. He's a retired professor like me, only he takes the evolutionary side of things, and he says that although the human eye would be a scandal if it were the result of divine deliberation, it would be a scandalous God who made such an eye, he says, there is a plausible evolutionary explanation of its absurd construction. You've heard of Richard Dawkins, wrote The Blind Watchmaker. That man knows more things that aren't true than perhaps anyone alive. <laughs> he says, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point towards the light with their wires leading backwards towards the brain. In other words, that the light-sensitive cells would face out towards the light, not the other direction. It sounds pretty good so far to me. He would laugh at any suggestion that the photocells might point away from the light. Wow, do they point away from the light? They really do. All mammals, all vertebrates, the retina is in upside down. Years ago, I used to work with a sheet film camera. It shows you how old I am. We had these big old press cameras that had the bellows, and you had to put the sheets of film in, load them in a holder. You did it in the dark, and it was quite easy to put the film in upside down. So the back of the film was towards the light rather than the front. And then you went out and you took all these pictures you never get again. You go into the dark and you develop them. <laughs> you end up with about 200 ukulele picks. I mean, that's about all you get out of it. Uh, the film's end upside down. Well, that does it right there. Obviously, an evolutionist wouldn't even think of studying a retina to try to understand why it might be advantageous to have the film end upside down. Uh, he can afford to just ignore it. And this leads to bad science. Because if you ignore evolution and just... Pre now, just behind these light-sensitive cells, we have a pigment layer. And this pigment layer is just full of blood vessels. Now, that begins to explain why uh, the retina is arranged as it is. And by the way, this retina is sensitive to a single photon of light. One photon. How much can you improve on that? <laughs> you say, well, if it was put together, right, and it was the right side around, maybe it would see sharper. Well, the resolution is limited by the optics, the lens and the cornea, not by the retina. The retina is better than the lens and cornea when it comes to resolution. So you can't improve on it by simply moving things around, but you can be sure there are reasons that it is the way it is. Let's look at that. Here's a drawing makes things a little clearer. These are the light-sensitive cells, the rods and the cones. The cones see color. The, the others see kind of more black and white. And uh, the ends of these cells, the ends of the photoreceptors, called the outer segments, are the most metabolically active tissues in the body. They have to be replaced every seven days. You're burning them out. And when they're replaced, they're just shed right off the end of the cell, so you've got a bunch of trash here. What do you plan on doing with that trash? You have to have cells ready 
to eat it up and digest it, called macrophages. And you don't want those cells in the way of your vision. So by having it backwards, as the outer segments turn over, the cells that digest them are in this next layer out here. The other advantage is that when light comes down through the retina, it's very important that it, the last thing it does is fire this light-sensitive part of the photoreceptor. After that, the light must be trapped in the pigment. If it were to reflect off non-pigment things and come back through the retina, you'd burn out your retinas faster than seven days. And so that's a good reason to have this pigment right here. But the best reason of all the retinas upside down is about 95% of the blood coming to the retina is in this layer back here. These are not merely blood vessels. This is a lake of blood. 5% of the blood's on top of the retina. So you actually have to look through 5% of the blood to see. How would you like to look through 95% of the blood? It's a blood sandwich because of the metabolic activity here. So having it in there backwards is optimum. You can't improve on it. In fact, to give you an idea how great it is, several years ago, a neurophysiologist uh, published an article in Byte, and he was trying to simulate what the retina is actually doing, the signal processing going on in the retina. He says to simulate 10 milliseconds, that's 10 thousandths of a second, of the complete processing of even a single nerve cell from the retina would require the solution of about 500 simultaneous nonlinear differential equations 100 times and would take at least several minutes of processing time on a Cray supercomputer. This computer is so big and so expensive the Cray company doesn't own one of their own computers. Government buys them. He says, keeping in mind that there are 10 million or more such cells interacting with each other in complicated ways, it would take a minimum of 100 years of cray time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. What do you figure? Chance on that one. <laughs> and, 